Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ashish. Uh, I will talk about our work on evaluating the quality of generative models, uh, formally titled uh, Adaptive Stratified Sampling for Precision Recall Estimation. So uh, here's the setup. Uh, we have uh, uh, machine learning and especially deep learning is growing very fast and we have large scale machine learning methods that are not able, and that are not just discriminative models, but they're able to generate lots of new data. Um, and it comes in a variety of shapes and, and styles like image captions at the scale of all of say Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons uh, or a large NLP resources like about 200 million paraphrase uh, pairs of, of, of phrases just for English and then for many other languages as well. And even things like poetry where there are programs now that can generate a million poems uh, for you to enjoy. The, and these things are uh, either for human consumption or machine consumption down a pipeline or both. Uh, the problem is that we don't quite understand how good they are. Right, because this is new data that you can't necessarily evaluate against uh, a hidden uh, or a held out test set. You can read, so you get a new poem, you have to figure out whether it's good or not, or how good it is if I generate more and more poems using the same model. Um, the good part is that we don't need to do it ourselves as model developers. We can use uh, advances in crowdsourcing to do this cheaply at a much larger scale, at least at the scales of tens of thousands of annotations at a fairly decent uh, cost. So we, we have that ability. Uh, but the challenge is that the rate at which we are generating new data, new interesting uh, structured output, that outpaces the rate at which we can still annotate them. So there's still that large gap, often orders of magnitude between millions versus tens of thousands. And the question is, how can we assess the quality of these models by annotating few, um, few of the, the generated data points? Right? And we'll quantify what few is as we go along. And here's a bit more formal uh, setup. You are given a model, uh, some black box that produces some output. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just write it as you know, Gen X, Gen P, Gen Z, and so on. Uh, we don't and I necessarily care what that is, except the annotator might care. Um, but we'll look at the uh, the part uh, of uh, oh, I have a mouse. Uh, the confidence that the model assigns to the correctness or the validity of that output, right? So we, let's sort it in decreasing order. So at the top, we have the most confident output. And as we go down, uh, we get this rank list of least, uh, less and less confident, but still generated output. Uh, we have this very long list. Uh, if we had an oracle, we could pose each of these generated outputs to the Oracle, and the Oracle would say, yes, this is good, no, this is not good, and you get a list like green and red annotations. Uh, hopefully, if their model is good, the higher confidence things are better, so you will see more of the green at the top and more of the red at the bottom. Right? If you had access to that, you could compute what's called the precision uh, of such a model, which is simply the, uh, it's the running precision, so it's the average of the zero, one numbers for the for the top k items in this list, right? Uh, so for example, the, the precision of the very first item is one because it's good. The second item up till then precision is still one because it's good. After third item, your precision is 0.67 because one of the two items was incorrectly, uh, it was produced, but it wasn't valid according to the Oracle. And similarly, you can go down the list, presumably your, your uh, uh, precision, although it will fluctuate, it will generally tend to go down. Right? And then you can make a plot out of this. That looks like a familiar precision recall curve. Here it's the precision function. It's the function of, uh, is the precision as a function of the rank R, which is as, as you go down the list, okay? Uh, so again, it's, it's, it has a general trend of uh, going down, but it does have fluctuations all around just because it's an average of zeros and ones and discrete numbers. Now the problem is you don't have access to that oracle. What you get is a noisy and partial annotation Right? So you get a few ones, uh, you mislabel some ones as zeros and, and vice versa, and you get to detect some zeros. And you get a bunch of question marks that you didn't have you know, money to annotate. The question is, can we still uh, get a good approximation of the precision function, PR? Right? So that's the setup. Um, we are going to evaluate it against two metrics. Uh, so as we, uh, as we get more and more annotations, we can have two kinds of algorithms. One that operates sort of at a meta level that says I'm going to find some carefully chosen blue points and I'm going to query the precision at those points. Right? So I'm going to say what is the precision at, at each of these four points and do some magic interpolation to plot the entire curve. In this case, we are going to measure the, uh, uh, the success of the algorithm both by how tight the, the approximation is and also how many blue points did you have to query. Right? And we'll, we'll assume that for each blue point you can get some beta approximation of it. 
In the model on the right, we'll work directly with annotations and say for each point, uh, I can query it, um, and I can get either a one or zero annotation, and I'll, I won't have money to annotate all of them, so there'll be some question marks in there, and the question will be how many of these you know, green and red annotations do I need? And we'll again assume that there's some error probability in these, so each one or zero flips with probability, some small eta. Okay. For simplifying, uh, simplifying for the talk, I'll not talk about beta and eta anymore, but they are in the paper. So what do we know about this problem? Right, so we want, let's say we want to generate an one plus epsilon approximation of the entire precision fraction. So it's a pointwise approximation at every, every rank R uh, for potentially millions of, of data points. Uh, if you don't make any assumptions about the data, there's not much you can do. Right? You can do subsampling, you can and kind of extrapolate from that, you can do stratified sampling. In either case, you run into this uh, square root of n barrier, meaning that you need to annotate at least square root of n log n points to be able to guarantee any kind of pointwise approximation. So we did some work last year uh, and presented at UI as well, uh, and where we said if you do make some assumptions, you can get uh, much further. Uh, so we had this algorithm called logstrat for logarithmic certified sampling, and that uh, said that if you assume some mild monotonicity of the data, and I'll, uh, in a couple of slides, make it more precise, then you can get by with only log n precision queries, so on, only log n of those blue points. And that translates into about log n, log, log n actual annotations of the data. So it's an active learning setting where the algorithm proposes, here's a point, give me precision at that point, and these are the things that you should annotate. And based on that, it, it comes up with this uh, one plus epsilon approximation. And throughout the talk, all of these logs are to the base of uh, one plus epsilon written at the bottom. So all of these scale roughly inversely with epsilon. Okay. And then we also had this other result uh, that assumed a stronger notion of monotonicity that was akin to uh, again, broad concavity, under which you can say you can even get rid of that log log n term and do the whole thing with log n annotations with some delta, which is a parameter of the, how tight your monotonicity is. So in this work, we are not gonna make that strong assumptions. We'll stick with the mild one, but try to do better than this. And what we are gonna change is, uh, this algorithm was completely data oblivious. You give me, not the, not the data at all, but just give me the number of points you have, the big N, and I'll tell you what to do, right? So it was completely independent of data. The new algorithm for this year is adaptive. So you give me N, I give you some points, you give me back some annotations, and then I keep iterating over that. So with that, we can do, turns out, much, much better, at least on real life data, so, and, and even asymptotically. So now we have adaptive stratified sampling, uh, short uh, ADA strat, that, uh, Query is precision at k points, where k ranges from two to log n, and we'll, I'll show you some examples where it's it's only about like a couple dozen, like so about uh, 20 or so points, when n is something like uh, three million. So it can be very, very small in practice as well. It makes so many queries, and, uh, accord and correspondingly, you need k log k actual annotations. Uh, we uh, did some theoretical analysis and showed that this is actually uh, best possible in an asymptotic uh, worst case sen a sense for the algorithms that operate this way, that, that, that pick these blue points and try to annotate them. Right? And we also have some regret analysis that says that this case, uh, although it's data dependent, it is uh, uh, it, the regret that you have not knowing the, the actual data is, is not too much, meaning that even if I knew the whole uh, thing in advance if an oracle knew it, it would have to annotate at least k log, it will have to query at least k times log log n points. So it's, it's close to optimal. And perhaps most interestingly, it's the practicality. As I just mentioned, uh, we have some examples where it's a real or realistic data set, uh, starting from a real one and expanding it, where, you can, uh, where, where the k is really, really small. So for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on parts one and four. Let's get to that assumption uh, that I mentioned earlier, weak monotonicity. What this says is that if you plot this precision function, so precision as a function of the rank R, uh, in the beginning, we can't do much. These uh, functions tend to be very erratic uh, just because they are averages of a few zero, uh, numbers of zero ones. But once you get far enough, these averages stabilize and you start to see some trend. So after that initial gray point, uh, this monotonicity assumption says that if you look at two points that are far apart, in this case parameterized by m, if m is, uh, m is the parameter of the monotonicity, if they're at least m apart, then the precision is, uh, can only go down. Right? So if you take two points here and here, if this is far apart, you cannot go up. So that's, that's, the, quali uh, that's the property of your model. Right? So if your model's confidence function was completely bad, this wouldn't happen. But if it's a reasonable model, you expect confidence going down 
leading to the, the uh, precision going down as well. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, we will make this assumption and then kind of see how it, that fits data. Uh, so the, uh, I have two slides on the actual algorithm. One is the, the key idea and one is how it leads to that algorithm. Um, the idea is about uh, is, is this precision envelope and uh, here's how that works. Uh, let's say we are operating uh, under this mode of uh, identifying these blue dots and let's say we have identified one of these dots, the one with the black circle marked. Right? What do we know at this point? Well, we can uh, zoom into it, and it turns out that if you, if you know uh, the exact value, and that's just an assumption for the talk in the paper we have in approximation, if you know the exact value, you know a lot uh, about the precision function everywhere to the right and everywhere to the left. How does that work? Um, if you recall the definition of precision, it's just a, a sum of, uh, it's, it's an average of a growing list of zeros and ones. Since it's a large list, a uh, large average, uh, let's say you have some, some value at, at precision uh, at rank Y. If you add a few zeros, a few ones, things can't change too much just because it's an average of very large numbers, right? So even if they are all zeros, precision can't go down too much, and that leads to this, uh, this curve, red, and turning into blue, that, that's going down. That's going down exactly at the rate of one over R through that point, okay? And now if you use the weak monitor density assumption, that says that, well, if you are at a point Y, once you go to y plus m, your precision cannot go higher, it has to come down, right? So you put it together and then you can say, well, that's the red curve that makes this mountain and comes back down because it has to come down. And from the previous argument, because it can't come down too fast, it also cannot go up too much. Right? And so it's all mathematically formalized in the paper and all these lines that look like straight lines are all actual real curves, they're not real lines, uh, they're not straight lines, but essentially that's the worst that can happen. You can go up and down and, and so on. And then the blue curve is the corresponding thing that you can do on the other side, okay? So what this tells you is that if you combine just the definition and the simple assumption, then just knowing the precision at one point completely characterizes what can happen to the left and to the right from rank zero all the way to rank n. Right? Now that gives you an, an, uh, a good idea because now if you can keep doing this at different points, the more points we, uh, we, we capture, uh, we are gonna keep shrinking these possibilities and uh, we'll, we'll have a good estimate. Right. Uh, one other thing I would note is that this, uh, this curve is, uh, this envelope is tight in the sense that both the red and the blue things are plausible, valid uh, precision functions given the noisy data, uh, and, um, or, or given some data, this is always possible. Uh, and any valid curve that, uh, that passes through Y must lie within that gray area. Okay. So in that sense, it's a tight envelope. Now how do we use that to come up with a bound? It's, uh, it's uh, straightforward. We start with computing the um, computing uh, this precision at the very beginning, at the very end. That gives us one interval, and then we tr start bisecting it until the height of the envelope uh, and drops below the desired approximation ratio. So, in a little more detail, we start by fully annotating the initial part because we don't uh, don't know what's in that area and how, how big that initial part is depends on your monitor density parameter M and the epsilon that you care about. Um, then we query, as I said, the beginning and the end. For, for these queries, we can just simply use, uh, use simply random sampling and some Hupting bound like inequality to, to get guaranteed bounds. Uh, we can we actually do something a little bit better with stratified sampling and reuse uh, prior samples as well. Uh, since at the end for the analysis, we'll use union bound, so uh, independence doesn't matter. Given these two points, we compute the, uh, the precision, uh, the, we create this envelope and, and tighten it accordingly. And then once we have that envelope, we find it an interval that is very tall, bisect it, and turns out geometric uh, bisection is the best. Uh, we cut it in, at that point, evaluate uh, precision at that point, and then tighten the envelope and continue this until the env envelope is very thin. Okay. Or rather, it's not very tall. Uh, yeah, so that's the algorithm. Uh, we stop when the envelope height is at most one plus epsilon square, and then you can imagine what you output is something that lies in between that's within one plus epsilon on, on each of the blue and red lines. Uh, I have a couple of slides on the results. So this is the result that I mentioned earlier. There are some more in the paper. Uh, so log strat is the algorithm from last year, add a strat from this year. This is a data set where we started with the real, uh, real data, but that only had about 35,000 points annotated just because annotation is costly. Uh, we scaled it up with a little bit of random per uh, perturbation to three and a half million points and plotted the curve that looks 
similar. So in both cases, the true curve is in the back, and these are approximations that look like zigzag lines. And in both cases, they are pretty good, except for that one point where it's a little flat, and you can see there on the right that the more density condition is violated, the plot actually go, the, the true plot goes up, so the algorithm fails at that point. Uh, but most importantly, uh, Logstrat used uh, 234 precision queries, whereas uh, Adastrat needs about an order of magnitude less, only 18 queries. Okay. Uh, and this is another uh, set of results with how the algorithm scale as we increase the number of data points. In the interest of time, I'll focus only on the right one, which is the number of annotations in a log-log plot. The blue line is the conventional sampling, which if you remember, that scales as square root of n, so that's a straight line in this plot, whereas other algorithms, the, the green is at a straight at the bottom. And uh, here it's about as good as this, uh, this strong monitor city algorithm we had last year, but it's, uh, it's, uh, and it makes much fewer assumptions and works much better. In summary, uh, we have introduced Adastrat, which is a new adaptive algorithm to assess the quality of generative models when they are generating you know, scale uh, data at a very large scale. It's a practically useful model, and we have some theoretical guarantees to back up uh, that it's, it's actually doing meaningful things, and it's close to what one could do optimally. Thank you.